So good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Draper. I am retired from the juvenile court bench here in Milwaukee County, Wisconsin. Before I tell you anything else, I want to say on behalf of each of us, we are incredibly proud of you. You know, we haven't heard you say a word, but the fact that you are here and not only did you go through the year and put together that, but you did well enough to make it to the national. So we want to be sure you know that frankly, we're on your side because we just think you did a great job already. And we wanna hear what else you've got to say so you can make us even that much prouder. Um, having told you that um, what I currently do, I am currently vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion of the Institute for Lawyer Wellbeing. Mr. Allison. Good morning. I am Robert Allison. I teach history at Suffolk University in Boston, Massachusetts. I've spent about 40 years in Boston, although I have to tell you, I spent my formative years in Essex County, New Jersey, and I'm very proud of you for representing New Jersey here and for your study of the Constitution, which of course is something that will last through the rest of your life. So thank you for doing this. And good morning, I'm Jack Barlow. I'm a professor of politics at Junietta College in Pennsylvania, which is right next door to New Jersey. That's as close as I can get. Um, so, um, we're all very happy to see you here and looking forward to a conversation about the Constitution and all of that stuff, so. Can I get you to introduce yourselves and your teacher, please? Of course. Uh, Mr. Paulson, I think you should introduce yourself first and then we'll go. <laughs> well, you'll have to unmute yourself if you want us to hear you. I apologize. Um, hello, my name is Albert Paulson, and uh, I teach a course um, called uh, Introduction of Political and Legal Experiences, where we the people is certainly uh, the, the, the essence of, of everything that we do in the course, and, uh, and this is just a great privilege for us to participate in this program. And just very proud of my students and all their hard work. Mr. Paulson, what, what school? Uh, West Windsor Plainsboro High School North. Oh, okay. Yeah, I actually lived in Plainsboro for a year, so. Oh, okay. All right. So my name is Panishri Akshintala. I'm a senior at West Windsor Plainsboro High School North, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm also a senior at West Windsor Plainsboro High School North. My pronouns are she, her, and I guess a fun fact about me is that I play tennis, and it's nice to meet you all. Hello, my name is Lionel Quaino. I'm also a senior at West Windsor Plainsboro High School North. Uh, my pronouns is he, him. And a fun fact about me is I'm a black belt. Hi, my name is Heather Murphy. I'm also a senior at West Windsor Plainsboro High School North. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And a fun fact about me is I love to travel and I've been to over 15 different countries. All right, I know you all now. Yeah, appreciate that. So in unit two uh, today, we are doing the first question. What were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? Begin. After anarchy from Shays Rebellion, 55 delegates arrived in Philadelphia to realize a new form of government. Although united in their vision, they hotly debated many issues, including but not limited to slavery, Congress, and the executive branch. Some concerns were how to count enslaved people, if they should be counted at all, the role of the executive branch, how many executives we should have, what powers the executive should have, the power wielded by Congress, and according to Madison, the great difficulty of representation. If this could be adjusted, all others would be surmountable. However, through compromise and civil discourse, delegates resolve these issues. Originally, large and small states were unyielding in their desire for power, and in different committees created the New Jersey and Virginia plan. This eventually led to the Great Compromise, where Congress would have both proportional and equal representation. The Federalists and Anti-Federalists compromised on congressional power by specifying grounds of authority, while also adding the necessary and proper clause for the uncertainties of the future. These solutions are not perfect, but stand to show the cooperation that built the Constitution. 
All the delegates at the convention understood the need to compromise on slavery was necessary to keep the Southern delegates at the convention. Therefore, the delegates arrived at an agreement to keep the three-fifths compromise from the Articles of Confederation. However, the consequences of such agreement proved to be fatal, provoking the Civil War and violent affairs over the Kansas and Nebraska Act. In addition, the framers never ensured the right to vote under the Constitution, leading to a fight for the right to vote from African Americans to Native Americans to women. However, the right to vote was not ensured to women until 1919 when the 19th Amendment passed and all people until 1964 under the Civil Rights Act. While the framers could agree to move naturalization power to the national government, they did not clearly define citizenship and thought it would be best for states to decide on citizenship. The 14th Amendment not ratified until 1868 granted citizenship to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and guaranteed all citizens equal protection of the laws. The final issue left unresolved was states' rights. The 10th Amendment mandates that the federal government is not allowed to interfere with powers of the state reserved or implied to them. This amendment left much controversy and a delicate balance over the years as to what was considered overstepping by the various levels of government. The Constitution in its entirety is meant to be the essence of the people. So when asked what changes should be made to the Constitution, we can only propose additions that would better secure the country's future, especially in regards to its legislative future. The only way to do this is to impose term limits, similar to what was developed under the 22nd Amendment, which restricted presidents to serve two terms. Alternatively, Roger Sherman proclaimed, nothing renders government more unstable than frequent change of persons that administer it. That argues that the reason why Congress does not need term limits is if Congress members were constantly changing, Congress as a whole would be ineffective in making change. But even as Brutus predicted in Brutus won, today's factions of the majority control what is being put on the legislative agenda. People of today are now currently stuck with an ineffective Congress, which is one of the major reasons why Gallup analysts claim that congressional approval ratings have slightly decreased over the past two decades. The only way to change this is by infusing Congress with a new life that encourages new ideas, energetic yet civil discourse, and a revolving membership of representatives that put people before faction. While there are constitutional amendments such as the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery and the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, this does not necessarily solve the problems regarding inequality. While the government is sometimes slow to react and take action, there have been significant changes to the initial constitution that provide the foundation for an effective republic. There is no amendment that could be added that can enforce equality because not only would this infringe on people's constitutional rights, but the government cannot change the way that people think. The constitution has, for the most part, addressed the concerns of the people. However, there is only so much much that a republic can do. As long as the correct amendments are in place, it's left up to the people to work together and promote equality. As Judge Learned Hand said, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, no constitution, no law, no court can save it. Thank you. Let me start with what may sound like a simple question, but I want you to think about it for a minute. In your statement, you discuss the fact that government is slow to react. My question is, isn't that a good thing? Because it, 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 the emotions of the moment may not be what we want to have happen. So my question is, isn't that in fact one of the strengths of government that it really is slow and a whole bunch of people have to come together? I'd say that it can be a strength and a weakness. A weakness in that people want to see change immediately, but realistically that cannot happen. And because of that, I think that's the reason why people give Congress such a low approval rating. I'd like to add to Caitlin by saying it's more of a, a at least in the past year, you could argue it's been a weakness because especially in New Jersey, we look at the COVID-19 crisis and we saw the slow reaction of the government and we lost numerous people in retirement or elderly homes because the government was slow to react and initiate um, proper quarantining or proper, simply because we didn't have the knowledge at the time, but if we had been able to react faster, we probably could have saved numerous lives. I have to agree with both of my colleagues. I think another thing is, especially when talking about politics and government, we can't talk in absolutes ever because no statement will ever be correct 100% of the time. So I think, you know, um, the government as a whole acting quickly in some scenarios such as war is critical, such as the pandemic is critical, but also, you know, when there are more sensitivities and nuances, being able to take a step back and reacting slower is also critical. So I think, you know, as the people, we place trust in our governing body to be able to decide when the appropriate time and what speed we should react to. So I think, you know, the governing body makes mistakes. Sometimes they don't react quick enough. Sometimes they react quickly, 
but as you know, the people, we have to hold them accountable and call out when they're not behaving the way we want them to. Thank you. If I may, um, you've raised so many wonderful points. I'd like to spend the rest of the day discussing with you, but I'm really just thinking about um, the question, the question of Congress. And one question that came up at the time of the Constitution and today is the size of it. And would Congress be more effective if it were bigger and more representative or would it be more effective if it were smaller? Can you tell me what you think? So looking at the size of Congress, we obviously have two senators per state. And then right now we have about 750,000 um, people per one representative in the House. And that, although the number has grown over time, that number was set in around the 1910s. I forget the specific date. And with a huge size Congress, we have to look at efficiency. And if we increase the size, that could in decrease the efficiency. So about what we have now, I would say, is it the right size to represent the people that we do have? I, I completely agree with my colleague's statement. I feel we feel that Congress as a whole is meant to be um, proportional to the citizens. So if we're, if we're gonna start increasing now the Congress members, the House members, because senators, we already have two per state, which allows for us to have uh, appropriate representation throughout the states. But if we were to increase the House now, we'd only have more in, ineffective, more ineffective decisions based on simply their, the number of people who are there. So having a smaller, um, a smaller a smaller cap allows for a better a better more efficient way of not only reaching out to their senator or to your representative but also allowing for you to continue and you represent your people as you now as we have a system that allows for you to be elected uh, I'd like to slightly agree uh, disagree sorry with my colleagues because um, I think that, it's difficult for one representative to directly reflect all, all of the beliefs of 700, 750,000 people. And this means that I think this has to do with, um, in a Gallup study, um, citizens gave their own representatives a 46% approval rating. They gave Congress overall a 16% approval rating, but it's still lower than 50%. And I think this is due to um, the discrepancy between um, it could be two parties or they believe that one representative is just not enough uh, in the House. So talk to me a little bit about the Senate. Um, I mean, the Senate has two senators per state, regardless of the population. Um, should the Senate be reformed to give a more proportional uh, representation for people? I mean, should New York have more senators than Wyoming, for example? I don't think so. And I think that's actually a really, really important question. But I think the founders, they made this decision on purpose. There was a reason to it. We had conflicts between smaller and large states in terms of representation and choosing a bicameral legislature was a very purposeful choice. And I think it's important to have that legit, like bicameral kind of form of government still here today, because I think some of those old feelings between large and small states can definitely come back. And now when political tensions, I would argue are even more sensitive, it might not be the smartest choice. And I also think having, you know, Senate be, sorry, equal representation and Cong Congress be proportional representation adds a layer of checks and balances for all states and all power. So I think you know, of course, the system isn't perfect. Of course, you know, there's a lot we could do as a country to make this process smoother. But I think, you know, in terms of a bicameral legislature, that was a good choice. And it's one that should stay the same. Uh, yeah, and adding to my colleague, we saw the passing of the 17th Amendment in 1913, which amended the Senate by allowing direct election of US senators. So I think that definitely helped increase the people keep feeling like their words were heard. And it definitely added to this feeling that the Senate, although only two representatives, definitely represented the people in each state. And as Panishri said, it's having equal representation was very important to the small states at the founding of our constitution. 
So you think well, Madison was wrong when he said that the compromise that provided for equal representation in the Senate was going to destroy the Constitution? Yes, I think that it was needed. And I do disagree with Madison saying that it would destroy our Constitution. Because you never know, this small stage could have just walked out and said, like the Southern delegates did by saying, we're going to walk out if you don't keep slavery. The small states could have done the same thing. Okay. Considering that we, a few decades after the Constitution, ended up having a war, doesn't it seem to you that all these compromises were just, uh, we're not going to make any decisions, we're just going to put our problems on hold? Do you think that we, or they had, they had seen um, compromises as a way to continue their time, their time on spending to to spend on the issue, but they never really addressed it, which is one of the major reasons why we had the Civil War. So I, I do agree that at the time, I would agree that at the time it was needed in order for us to have a a, a, a system of government, but it was terrible. To, sorry. I'm sorry. Did you finish your sentence? Finish your sentence. Okay. Please. Yeah. But it was it was it was a terrible compromise because we simply never addressed the the key problem, which is why we have a civil war. We had a civil war. Okay. Well. Okay. So first of all, let me give you a hand. Let's start with that, and then I want to tell you I I enjoyed the uh, your presentation. Um, what what I would like to posit to you is, um, and, and it was what I, where I was going with that last question. Um, you know, we had some wonderful principles and some really good language and we just didn't live by it. We wrote some rules that said, this is what we aspire to. This is why we're doing this. But the South said they'll leave if we mess with slavery, so we're not going to do that. And we want to be sure that we represent the people. So we're going to have these rich people up here in the Senate. And we're going to, I mean, just sort of understand, we talked a good game, I guess, is where I'm going with this. Now, having said that, this country is still here. And yes, we had some bumps and we've had some problems. So maybe what we came up with was what was necessary. Um, I don't know if necessary is the right word because it's what got us here. You did a really good job of bringing in the amendments, 10th, 19th. I made a number of comments to myself. And since I've used up most of my review time chatting, I won't get to tell you what they were, but you did a good job. Thank you. you thank you. You did a terrific job, I think. Um, it was impressive. The thing that really stood out to me was you disagreed, not, not only with Madison and Heather takes a certain boldness to say, yes, Madison was wrong. You might be wrong, but uh, you're thinking. And when you disagreed with each other, that was even better because you are thinking for yourself, which is the essential thing because we live in, as you've made it clear, a republic where people do disagree and you looked at different sides of very complicated questions and were able to explain them. And you know, you'll continue through your lives looking at complicated questions and hopefully you will be doing good jobs of resolving them. Um, I don't want to say anything about the generation of Judge Draper and Judge Bar Professor Barlow and myself, but I think uh, the country will be in good hands. So thank you. I undoubtedly the country is going to be in good hands. I think you guys did a very nice job. Um, uh, you had some disagreements. That's great. I mean, it means that you're you're comfortable having conversations about this stuff. Um, and I think as much as anything, that is what we need to think of the Constitution um, as providing, right, is opportunities for conversation. Uh, and so, yeah, a conversation between us and Madison over whether states should be equally represented, for example, and we can disagree with Madison. And that's great. Um, and by the way, Heather, you, you blanked on the date on the, uh, and I want to assure you, because that's, this is the kind of thing that you, you go back to your room and you go, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't remember that date. Don't worry about it. We can't remember dates either. Um, 
you know, and, and so it's fine. My one question for you, uh, you kept coming back to the point about Congress's approval ratings in the, in the polls. Um, and that's fine, but that strikes me as maybe not being an essential uh, criterion for deciding whether Congress is doing a good job or not. Um, so I just say that in, in passing, I'm not sure what I would propose as a substitute for that, uh, but I think that um, it, it, just, it just stood out to me as, as being um, problematic. So as Judge Raver said, I think that you guys did a nice job of bringing in um, basically all of American constitutional history, right? The different amendments and, uh, uh, you know, the, the freezing the size of the House of Representatives whenever it was. Um, so, I, you know, I think that um, you showed us clearly that, A, you're having a lively conversation about this, and B, you know what you're talking about. So, good job. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and your critical feedback. It's something that we'll definitely have to take into account. And it was actually a pleasure and an honor to have this conversation. Thank you. I would like to agree with Panishri. It was a pleasure to be able to speak with you all today. I mean, you guys have a lot of wisdom and it was really nice having a con uh, conversation about the constitution and you really challenged us to think further than we may have. Thank you. Yeah.